All right. Well, welcome to everyone who is joining us on this cold, cold night. If you're in Pennsylvania, I hope you are all staying safe and warm with whatever our crazy weather decides to do. Um, we are the Northampton County Historical and Genealogical Society. We are um, based out of the Sickle Museum in Easton, Pennsylvania. And now the mission of the Northampton County Historical and Genealogical Society, or NCHGS, is to share the stories of Northampton County's past to encourage personal reflection, community dialogue, and an understanding of history's impact on our lives. It is our vision that through exploring local history, we will foster a more caring, respectful, and inclusive community. The Sigel Museum, where NCHGS is based, is home to a significant collection of pre-European settlement artifacts curated, loaned, and donated in collaboration with the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania. Our permanent, um, one of our newest exhibits and one of our permanent collections is, uh, it's called Destination Northampton County. Um, it tells the story of those who settled here long ago as well as today. We encourage you to become a member of NCHGS for invitations to opening receptions, free museum admission, and free access to our research library. For more information on our exhibits and our programs, you can visit siglmuseum.org. We will be having a question and answer period following this installment of our In Conversation series with Sean Kimber. Um, so please feel free to drop any questions into the chat feature at the bottom of the screen. We will respond to as many as our time allows. Um, tonight, we are thrilled and honored to be in conversation with Sean Kimber, um, an accomplished mathematician, visual artist, and activist. As a renowned quilt artist, Sean explores the history of cotton production and the historical and contemporary issues of racism and social justice. Her quilts have been acquired by many leading institutions, including the Smithsonian, the International Quilt Museum, and the Petrucci Family Foundation Collection of African American Art. The Sickle Museum is currently home to Kimber's Cotton Sophisticate, a six by six quilt in our temporary exhibit, Another American's Autobiography, selections from the Petrucci Family Foundation of Latin America, um, excuse me, uh, selections from the Petrucci Family Foundation Collection of African American Art. Um, so what we are going to do tonight is I will um, be in conversation with Sean asking a couple of guiding questions, um, but I really want to let Sean's incredible work take focus and take center stage. Um, so if you have any questions about um, Sean's work or um, some of the nuances that she works with in her, her many um, quilts, uh, please, as I said, drop them into the chat below um, and we will get started. Um, Sean, I was wondering if we could begin with you um, telling us a little bit about yourself and in particular, what it is that drew you into quilting. <clears throat> thanks, Sarah, and thanks for inviting me. And um, thanks to Megan von Ravensway, who's I think somewhere here um, for, and oh, Claudia Volpi, I cannot forget all the people who are bringing about the Petrucci exhibition that's at the Sigel Museum right now. Um, and I'm just honored to be the, the Easton resident <laughs> allowed to be adjacent <laughs> to all those wonderful artists in the exhibit. Um, I also want to just make sure that we're all mindful that uh, the world is not about quilts today. Uh, there is a lot going on. And um, so I don't want to in any way make light of the world, but thank you for taking a little respite with me for a short period of time to talk about frivolous things. And um, we'll get back to CNN um, right after this. I, well. I was going to say I hope, but maybe I don't hope. I hope we all can take a little break for a little minute in the privilege that we have here. Um, so <laughs> um, a little about me. So I, yes, I'm a mathematician. I was a professor at Lafayette there in Easton for 20 years, and now I'm a dean at a university uh, a little bit south of Pennsylvania, but not south enough. I still get snow. Um, I... <laughs> Uh, yeah, so my quilt history, is that what you asked about? Yeah, so I started quilting um, when I applied for tenure, which is a form of um, 
hazing that professors do to each other um, to determine whether you get to be part of the club and have a job for life in essence. And um, I was really kind of not enjoying the lack of control over my future. I handed in my my file and my colleagues were judging me. Um, there's one here on the screen, um, but he was a nice one. Um, and they were all nice. Uh, but there was just a need to kind of get the this anxiety out. And it was an, a level of anxiety that I hadn't really experienced before. So my sister sent me a, a super cheap sewing machine and I picked up that yellow book quilting for dummies. And um, I made every project in the book because I wanted to develop all the skills that I could. But then, you know, started uh, working on my own patterns and the ways that quilters back in the day would do naturally. Um, those weren't necessarily art quilts, but they were um, explorations of geometric patterns uh, in a very natural way. Uh, quilts were in my life growing up. My great grandmother made quilts uh, in Alabama and out of necessity, they were utility pieces made from old clothes and she had used threadbare clothes to make them. And so as the quilts wore out, she put patches onto the patchwork. And so it became more of a sculpture. Um, and I just I remember the texture of running my hands across it um, when you uh, when you live uh, in poverty, you don't have the money to buy fresh batting to go as the insulating layer in the middle of a quilt. So your old quilt becomes the oh. batting layer inside there. And so it's actually the original uh, heavy blanket, um, weighted blankets, right? So they're super heavy because they had the weight of multiple quilts inside of them. And, um, and I think I just always had this need to try to make a quilt. I was a sewist for garments. Uh, it's a southern thing. We can go into that later. But uh, and so I did have some sewing skills and it was wonderful to apply to quilting. That's wonderful. So the Signal Museum currently has your six by six quilt Cotton Sophisticate, um, which is on view until early July of 2022. So in the in the same vein, when you were speaking about um, your grandmother, could you tell us the inspiration behind Cotton Sophisticate, please? Yeah. Is it OK if we show a picture of it? Absolutely. Just so people don't know that one. So can I share screen? Figure out how to. I think that's on your end. I uh, know you go under under security settings. Ah. You have to allow us all to share screen. Ah. <laughs> but um, this is a room full of my friends, so they're not going to swoop in. Um. <laughs> all right, you may share your screen, ma'am. Okay, so let me share a photo and let's see what happens so and just let me know if you can see it so can you see oh yeah the, perfect the okay you can see that okay good um so yeah when you say six by six i want to be really specific it's six feet by six yes feet. <laughs> So uh, it's not small, it's quite large. And so when you think about that, think about the um, smallness of the pieces that go into making it. Um, so this quilt uh, arose in a quite uh, capitalist way. So the, a new company uh, came on the scene, it's called American Made Brand. And they're interesting because they use American farmed cotton <clears throat> and then manufacture it into cloth here in the United States. And that is a very rare thing these days. And um, what that means is that we know the labor stream that goes into the, the fabric that we're working with here. Uh, at least we know it's uh, beholden to US labor laws and we hope that those are being followed uh there there's a lot of fabric um even if the clothes on our backs right now where we also we do not know the origin and we don't know the labor that goes into them 
uh, and I think that we should become more conscious of that. So I was quite interested in this new company coming on and they had a contest when they first opened up and they, they um, said, if you make a quilt just using our fabrics, you can enter it into a contest to be in an exhibition at the International Quilt Festival in Houston. Um, and so I am, I was like, at, this was before I had started exhibiting at all. And so I thought, ooh, well, maybe I'll try that. And so I, oh, they didn't give you the fabrics, by the way, you had to buy them. So, you know. <laughs> new company trying to get their foothold mm -hmm. and so of course i bought one yard of all at each of the 75 colors that they had because i couldn't choose um and there are some principles of choosing color combinations that uh, i adhere to so kay facet who's a rather famous knitwear designer who also designs fabrics um he's always said right if your color combo isn't working very well you just add one color well my approach to that having very little time on my hands to be trying out new color combos is just to use them all at once and i think it kind of works it doesn't really look like clown vomit uh if you do it carefully so i started this project um i could actually i don't know if you can even see the arrow but i'm drawing a circle around the first square that I made. It's got that dense red center to it. And um, I came up with a technique to do this piecing quite efficiently. Um, the square, black squares, if you can read, just focus in on the black squares for a second. Uh, those are actually the centers of what are called the log cabin squares. And so around each black square, I put a layer on each side of these stripes and then do a layer of stripes around those and I build out from each of the black centers. And so I needed to make a ton of those in order to make the size that I wanted. And um, the lead time into this contest was like three months. Uh, yeah, I have a day job, so I was never going to make it. <laughs> um, and so the words started coming to me as I was making the first couple of blocks. And so the words, in essence, I'm a sophisticated cotton picker, um, is the concluding line of Eartha Kitt's autobiography. And Eartha Kitt, um, for the youngsters who are not um, privileged enough to know her, she was, you know, a quadruple threat, right? She was a dancer, a singer, an actress, and then overall entertainer. She was the original Catwoman. And, um, she grew up in North Carolina in a tiny, tiny town, and in the summer she picked cotton. Um, like much most of the people that I know in the South um, of a certain era. Even my father pulled off the side of the road as we were driving to my grandmother's house and made us pick cotton for five minutes. <laughs> and um, my sister, brother, and I were not the hardy souls that he wished we were. Um, and so this started to take on meaning as I was making it. So let's parse this phrase a couple of ways. First, it's an absolute joke, right? Uh, I am not a sophisticated picker if I choose to use all 75 colors without any sort of discernment. Um, there is discernment within the design here, if you know color theory, um, but uh, there's there's something to uh, the stereotype of the quilter as a fabric hoarder, um, but here I'm not hoarding, I'm using them all at once. But this is also a statement about slavery and um, it's a multi-layered statement about labor, right? So here we have this brand new company, um, I, you know, the labor force is what it is, um, and it's not all that diverse, and, but today it's under um, some enlightened labor standards, um, whereas our friend Eartha Kitt is commenting on um, a whole different universe of labor standards of the building of the country. And um, yeah, so I think I'll stop there. I think we're going into labor more in the next question. <laughs>
Yes. <laughs> I'll stop sharing here. So I can see yeah, how. Okay. So when you when you talk about labor, um, obviously in in this context, there are so many different ways that we can interpret that word labor, right? Um, and you had mentioned too that with this new company, as we would hope at least, um, following uh, labor law, can you um, tell us both in in a historical sense, but also in the creative sense, um, the many roles and intersections of labor that goes into quilting and in this quilt in particular? Yeah, so uh, let's do it instead of starting from the beginning, we'll start from the middle and go out in each direction. So yeah. let's start with the quilter. <laughs> so the quilter arrives at a fabric shop um, and there are many, it, it is a multi-billion dollar industry today. So when people say not your grandmother's quilt site, I have no idea what they're talking about because quilters are all ages, all races, all religions <laughs> in every region of the earth. Um, and so it's, it's a thing. <laughs> and it is, of course, commodified in the United States. And so there are all kinds of fabric shops, there are um, large big box stores, and then there are also the independent uh, fabric um, shops that you can go to that are owned by a family. Um, but they're all kind of managed through distributors of the cotton. So there's no difference in the cottons that you're getting necessarily. We can go into that. I'm sure there's some cultures here on the screen who would debate big box versus local cult store fabrics. But okay, yeah, anyway, <laughs> there's a lot. Um, and so you go to the store, you buy your fabrics, you buy your threads, and there is the full range of options to you from the most affordable um, to the most expensive. If you want to spend $15 on a spool of thread, there's a company there waiting to sell you a $15 spool of thread. Um, I am so sad to inform everyone that it's the same spool of thread that you can buy for a dollar at the big box store. Um, and, and so I'm just pulling out all the controversies today, but um, we we're when, ready for this shot. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's Threadgate 2022. <laughs> um, and so the, you have to start thinking about sort of when you make the decisions of what to spend on, you're making decisions about, um, there, you I mean fully your identity is coming through in certain ways. And so there, especially in the age of social media, those there are those who like to show off that they bought the $15 book of, of cotton, uh, thread, and it means something. So there's labor going in, in even just the retail sales of fabrics um, that needs to be analyzed. And you only need Google Joanne Fabrics to learn about some of the things that don't go well in a large store. Then the quilter takes all that fabric home and um, honestly, it is the most futile process on the face of the earth. You buy large sheets of fabric and then you cut it down into tiny, tiny pieces only to sew them back together again. And so it is highly laborious. Um, but some of us find uh, a lot of uh, therapeutic benefits from this activity uh, and, and there, it's yeah okay uh, it's also a way to kind of get ragey about the least important thing on the face of the earth if those corners aren't matching when you sew things up but it's a thing uh, and to sew a quilt it's you have to really kind of be committed to a long-term enterprise and um, it's got multiple steps it's got um, and all of them are a little uh, nitpicky and fiddly and there are a lot of arguments about how much to do on a machine and how much to do by hand and it just depends on whether you're a purist or if you're trying to just get something done if it's a quilt that's for a baby that maybe you know is not going to be treated so well or if it's um, something that's meant to become an heirloom or something that's meant to go in a museum one day and so the labor of making a quilt is enormous if anyone ever gives you a quilt <laughs> they just gave you a piece of their heart and so please love it accordingly um 
So is that good on the making of a quilt? We can yes. go in steps more, but it's really boring. If I start talking about basting, you want to just mute me. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Now let's go back in time from that quilt shop. How did that fabric arrive at that quilt shop? And um, and it depends on the time period we're in, of course. Right. And uh, so in so even that step, that immediate step there differs based on the region you're in and the time period. So um, there's uh, the the Amish quilts of uh, the Lancaster area of Pennsylvania, people have assigned all sorts of um, meaning to their decision to use solid colors and a hmm. certain range of solid colors. But it turns out through some quilt historians doing some research that that's just where the traveling, what the traveling salespeople had um, in their first few trips to the region, and then it became the favorite of the region. And it, each different settlements of Amish and Mennonite around the country have different um, favorite fabrics. So it's really hard to kind of just say, oh, well, the Amish only use black and pink and light green. Mm -hmm. um, so probably the pink and light green was originally red and green and it's faded over time, but whatever. Um, so, but even just the distribution plan determined the quilts that got made. Um, and so then there's labor to having, you know, roving salespeople. Um, but then in manufacturing of fabric is also quite intricate. And so when you think about your 300 thread cap sheets, a sheet is the same as uh, similar to the fabric that we're using to cut up to make a quilt today. And so if you've got that's 300 threads per square inch, and that's actually being woven by a machine um, previously would have been woven by a person not at such density but certainly dense enough that um, something could be sort of waterproof on the outside and so there's a high level of labor um, we should po start pointing to that this labor is mostly being done by women mm -hmm. Um, certainly from the quilter on, there are some really great male quilters in the world today, but that wasn't the case um, in, you know, in our historical past. Uh, the weaving of fabric uh, done in, say, the Lowell Mills in Massachusetts would have been done by very, very young women um, in highly dangerous uh, circumstances, and um, but it really was you know, the engine of the Industrial Revolution going on for us um, that kind of launched the United States as a country. Um, the, that, but then we have to back up to the inputs into that system. So the cotton didn't just um, show up <laughs> in Massachusetts. And it, of course, was uh, farmed and picked and processed um, by laborers uh, out in some fields somewhere and in the cotton gins. And um, it is a, a cotton uh, is the cotton plant is a very peculiar plant only now do we have um, I don't even know the names of like the big machiney things that kind of go through and have the claws that will kind of grab the tops of the cotton plants, um, but even that brings a lot of uh, extra stuff and so then the processing has extra steps to remove um, branches and um, seeds and other things. Um, and so even today with machines, it's a very special kind of plant to have to deal with uh, in, in agriculture. Um, but that would have been done by hand by people who were not being paid in the past. Um, and not being paid is a nice euphemism for um, our original sin as a nation. Um, and yeah, is that enough labor for you? I could go into a lot of different parts of the process, historically speaking, uh, and how we've innovated over time and how it's changed the lives of women over time and the lives of people like my ancestors. Yeah, I, I would love for you to speak a little bit about it in particular with your family, how it has changed the lives of women in your family, if you would like to, to touch on that. 
Well, sure, I guess. Um, so, yeah, I tend to kind of reflect on the way my great grandmother would have made a quilt versus how I make a quilt. Huh. And, um, and in fact, our outcomes are uh, similar uh, in that I'm quite uh inspired by the style of patchworking that she did so um it's called improvisational it's not the rigid uh geometric shapes that you might be familiar with in some mm -hmm. quilt but instead um it's more similar to jazz so i take one of those rigid geometric shapes but then i riff on it so i improvise on the the on the standard uh but using my own skills and so I earlier described um, that the quilt uh, sophisticated cotton picker um, was a, actually a log cabin quilt. And so that's my mm -hmm. version of um, improvising on the standard of the log cabin. Square and square, but made with stripes. And then also the stripes aren't regular, but then I'm doing a lot of color theory within those stripes. Um, yes. So but my great grandmother did not have a sewing machine <laughs> <laughs> and she did not have the means to buy fresh fabric mm -hmm. and so she's taking um piles of threadbare clothing um that are different colors they've been dyed um and they they were purchased clothes some of them were clothes that she had made originally to be you know their shirts and their pants mm -hmm. um a lot of jeans going on and she's combining the colors in the same ways that I do, but with a limited palette based on, you know, just whoever's wardrobe she's working with. Cutting with scissors. Um, and whereas I use, um, sometimes I use scissors only, and that has a particular uh, appearance when you do that. But quilters today use um, rotary cutters. They look like pizza cutters and acrylic rulers you can buy a ruler to do anything you want you can get highly specialized rulers and that's really kind of strange to me but i am always fascinated to see the new rulers um and so you know here are these contrasts um when people tell me they bought a 15 dollars spool of thread i'm like yeah my great grandmother never would have paid that much for a spool of thread and look how long her quilts lasted so you can't really tell me that that cheaper spool of thread wouldn't have uh it has a a, a differential in quality um and so there's a lot going on there too to make a quilt would have taken a long time to make a six foot by six foot quilt completely by hand with pieces that small, right? I did mine all on a sewing machine using specialized skills to do the patchwork. Um, she would have sewn pieces that small together one by one. So pair by pair, so tiny piece to tiny piece, mm -hmm. tiny piece to tiny piece, all by hand. And then eventually this very large, um, massive pass patchwork would have shown up so it took me a year to finish just the top of that quilt so just the patchwork um well i had a day, day job by the way but <laughs> it would have probably also taken her uh, many months to a year to finish a patchwork top that was similar and then just through every stage of the process of quilting so um but i also hand quilt so it also took me a year to hand quilt the entire quilt but she would have had a team <laughs> so <laughs> she definitely participated in bees my father was actually a presence of the sewing bees quilting bees and um loved to tell stories of uh his adventures underneath the quilt and oh. um, learning all the gossip of the community um, <laughs> yeah yeah that's um that's a, a question i want to get into a little later about um, quilting as storytelling um and I, I i'm just astounded that i'm i'm in the museum you know i i work in the museum and every time i pass by this quilt i always feel like there's there's a detail that i'm just seeing for the first time because there's so much happening within that quilt right um mm -hmm. and a little bit ago you had you had mentioned um that you got into quilting as a as a means of expression and as a means of um as a creative outlet to relieve stress um 
and in previous um, conversations and some of your writings, you talk about quilting as a means of, of social justice. Can you tell us a little more about this journey for you as a creative outlet and as a means of working towards justice? Yeah, so um, that first year that I was quilting, um, I made 12 quilt tops. Um, so that's just the patchwork, beautiful patchwork top that you see there. But I hadn't made the stitching between the three layers to make it a nice puffy and insulating uh, warm thing. So it was just that patchwork on the top, but it was exactly what I needed to be doing to get the therapeutic uh, results that I was looking for. Um, I did have friends who have what are called long arm machines who were quilting for me. It makes the process a lot faster about just a huge industrial machine that uh, just kind of it, it looks like a giant monster with a long arm out there with the, the sewing tip here. And so you're able to uh, manage very large wide spaces in a much more efficient manner than um, the, the home quilter rolls their quilt up like a sausage throws it across their shoulder and then you're shoving it <laughs> underneath the needle uh, oh, into wow. Tiny, tiny opening called the harp, and um, it's not pleasant. Um, and uh, but some people really like it. I'm sorry, it's unpleasant to me. Um, <laughs> and and so they're you know it's it's a thing. So I I would pay people to long arm quilt for me that year. I made twelve quilts from start to finish, but including some labor from some friends. That is unusual. I think I just described to you that the quilt I showed you before took me two years total to finish. Um, and that's once I started doing the hand quilting that it became a really extensive process. Um, and I got the call from the provost, um, so the person who's in charge of overseeing the tenure process. Um, she said, hey, dude, you got tenure. Of course, she didn't say it that way. That's totally <laughs> not. Uh, and I did not sew again for two years. It was as if I, you know, I did sit down and think about sewing, but it just wasn't there. I didn't need it, and I just put everything away. Um, I did keep looking at this cabinet that I had filled with fabrics as if I was, you know, storing for a rainy day mm -hmm. and just kept thinking, you know, I need to get back to that or else I need to get rid of that fabric. Um, I'm here to say I still have all that fabric um, that was in that cabinet <laughs> because when uh, two years later, my father passed away. Mm -hmm. And it was absolutely the worst thing that had ever happened to me. And I inherited his ties. He was, um, you know, he traveled a lot for work, and, but he really liked clothes and needed excuses to buy new clothes. Or, um, and so every time he would go on a trip, he would forget to take a tie and come home with one or two new ones and these piled up over the years uh certainly changing in with the years and eras of wide ties in the 70s with those wacky stripes and the 80s when it was splashy kind of um and more kind of novelty fabrics uh to the skinny tie era, era. <clears throat> and i know them all because i inherited them all and I, I took home uh, 500 quilt uh, ties. And um, I decided uh, after discovering the futility of quilting, right, suddenly it wasn't therapeutic to me to cut up fabric and then sew it back together in the ways that I was doing it before. Um, it suddenly needed to have some meaning in order for it to have the same therapeutic result. It sounds like I'm describing like the progression of an addiction sort of that you need progressively harder and harder drugs. I needed progressively more and more meaning in what I was making um, throughout um, my, my quilt. Uh, I don't know, blossoming. Um, so I made a couple of quilts using those ties, one for my sister, one for my brother. And there are still hundreds of ties left. And so one day I will make one of those quilts for myself. 
but there was something to the use of that fabric, the connection to my father, the connection to the past, um, that these ties were representative of who he was out in the world, right? Uh, not necessarily who he was at home, but, um, you know, I was able to find good and quirky ones uh, that really kind of communicated um, quite a bit of his personality. And so I started asking a lot of questions about what the fabrics mean when we choose something, um, whether it's that we, I don't know, we're not a quilter. I'm sorry for all of you if you are not and you have to go to like Nordstrom or whatever and buy a comforter and just yeah and you only have on offer what's there for sale but the deal is that they're not all just gray comforters the uniform of comforters there's all different patterns and styles and you somehow choose one based on your identity um and i think the proof is that we're not all buying the star wars comforter right and so i had this question about um how do you express identity in quilt form? And so I made, um, I, and I also was learning how to improvise letters at the same time. And so I made a, a quilt called Princess. And it's, you know, it's the word princess, um, but in pink fabric with tiny little flowers um, with a, a glorious pink background fabric that I can't find anymore, but I wish I had more. Um, and it's, you know, you bounce the letters in a nice way so that it's not a rigid line. And you're trying to kind of in some way graphically represent a princess. And I'm 100% I'm the princess to my father's royal kingdom. Um, I also made a bitch. <laughs> um, and it's the letters are embedded in a vintage sheet. Uh, that is this super soft um, and supple uh, fabric and but it's bounded by or protected by some dense denim and so it's it's representing sort of that hard exterior layer of a bitch who presents herself to the world in one way but on the inside is quite different um yeah, and so I there are other words that have been used to describe me and some are not as pleasant as princess or even bitch. And um, it's through that exploration that I kind of started to present my identity in, in ways that were surprising to people. How do we get to the social justice? Um, so, you know, it, it was Trayvon Martin, the killing of Trayvon Martin, that really um, kind of, I think, is probably where I would say that the switch flipped and I became an artist, not a not just a quilter, but an artist. I had certainly made art quilts before then, but not all art quilts are, you know, give you the badge of an artist, but um, and nor am I withholding artist badges you can all be artists if you want to be but um with a capital a uh and but i needed to have a way to process the uh police killings that were happening in the united states and um i started to explore it in this quilt form this quilting is where i am protected um, and it is where I am free to kind of think whatever I want to think <laughs> and say whatever I want to say and I take full advantage of that and so it's the social justice starts to happen when there's an audience for it and so to make a quilt about the Trayvon Martin uh, situation um, I intended it to be viewed. And I was thinking about the uh, ways that it could be used to educate people about what happened there. And so in the aftermath of the killing of Trayvon Martin, who was wearing a hoodie and carrying some Skittles and was gunned down, um, 
the on social media um a conservative person um a personality on fox news said well if he wasn't wearing a hoodie it never would have happened and so people on uh, twitter started taking pictures of themselves and posting them with i'm trayvon emblazoned across them in sort of this i'm spartacus moment and i kind of knew that this this is this statement was what I wanted to comment on, and it's the politics of fashion. It's it's about how people want to see you, not necessarily what you think you're presenting to the world. And so that quilt is four different views of me in a hoodie in two tone, in a two tone style, much like sort of if you think about the street artist Banksy, it's sort of that stencil type of um, approach to presenting sort of shapes that just sort of blossom out despite being quite simply um, constructed. And so I was looking for it to be exhibited and for people to engage with these four different ways that you can appear. And so there's one that makes me look super fierce in ways that I didn't know I could be, but it came from kind of a viewing me from down below. So I think I'm super scary to like toddlers. And then another, when you view me from up above, I can look like a contemplative nun in, in, a, in a hoodie. And so I'm asking people to think about how they choose to view people and whether we ought not try to view people in multiple ways before making a decision. That's how all of my quilts are uh, now. Um, I'm trying to ask people to think and uh, thinking at different depths with different ones of them. But then the social justice comes in, comes through awareness and um, doing a quilt form welcomes people into a warm and grandmotherly space, but then kind of smacks them across the face and asks them to think twice. Yeah, so part part of our role with, with NCHGS is as a historical society, um, our mission and our vision focus on understanding how history and how stories continue to inform the present, right? We are very much um, trying to live up to the phrase that history is never past. Um, we want to ensure that community stories survive and that they are given appropriate spaces to be to be held and to be heard and to respect it and to have dialogue about them. Um, so can you can you tell us um, we, we touched a little bit on it in some previous questions, but can you tell us about the role of quilting and quilt making in preserving stories, either in, in your family or in, in Trayvon Martin's case too? Yeah. So historically, quilts have served the same purpose as the family Bible. Um, so the family Bible was the place where you kept your your family's vital statistics um, through time. So people did not have birth certificates. There was the family Bible that you would show um, or someone kept that record. And so there are examples of quilts out there um, where births and deaths are, are recorded um, on them. Um, in the you know mainly kind of in the 1800s and uh it's it's fascinating to see essentially the infographic of the time mm. uh, demonstrating the huge problem of infant mortality for example and so you know if we were in one of my regular lectures i would be showing right now a picture of a quilt with little coffin shapes and it would be showing you kind of birth and death um dates and you would have a sense for just the, the enormity of um, that problem. And so here is also showing sort of a social justice issue. If we were to compare across um, income levels, there were some differences and that would be an interesting thing. And so now I'm ready to start a whole new talk. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, um, but quilts, uh, 
retain stories in a lot of ways. So I'm a member of a group called the Quilt Alliance that is all about documentation on quilts. There are so many anonymous quilts out there where we don't know who made them, um, but we're preserving them because they're absolutely gorgeous. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we could connect it back to the story of the maker or the story of the family or the story of its, its origin? Why did this person make this quilt and who was it given to and, you know, um, and so we're all about labeling of quilts. And so the quilts, there are many great quilters today doing just heroic work and beautiful work using the labeling on the back, even as a place to be artistic and expressive. And so that will also be carrying stories. Um, and so I would also kind of show you a quilt uh, with text on it um, made by, um, I always kind of view the story as made by the mother-in-law um, where she proclaims, you know, um, you know, God be the glory, right? And then she says, from your mother, <laughs> and then puts her name huge. <laughs> Across the bottom, her name's Lavinia Rose, and she wants you to know. And she made it in 1826 in Cortlandville, New York. And um, my friends and I call this the birth control quilt because imagine getting this quilt for your wedding. You put it on your bed. This is not exactly <laughs> the most in, uh, in a sexy time inspiring quilt, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's very loving and very expressive and we absolutely know the story behind this quilt because it's, it's carried there in the text that she made now i'm pretty sure lavinia might not have been the most fun lady to have a cup of tea with but um but we get to speculate on that we have the evidence that we can go on um, there are many quilts conveying stories today um, in a lot of different ways. Um, so people are, right, so, yeah, we can go a lot of different ways on this question. Um, I actually don't even know how to answer this. Uh, so in the time that we have remaining, right? So I don't wanna to go too deep in any one direction, but um, the social justice quilts that I make, the social justice quilts that some of my friends make um, are commemorations of moments in time. Um, mine, I tend to not want you to have to know the details of the situation to be able to interact with it. So I'm, a, I'm actually behaving like a mathematician by trying to abstract the concept of what's going on. So Trayvon Martin was an incident. If you know about that, you can interact with my quilt on a different level than if you don't know about it, but you're seeing that here are these four different images portraying a person wearing the same um, piece of clothing, but just from different perspectives. Um, I try to go for the more universal statement uh, than, rather than the, the immediate uh, deep where you have to know the details to mm -hmm. understand it. But the story is still being conveyed. Uh, it's the, uh, if you were to collect together my quilts that come through Black Lives Matter, a story would be conveyed through the collection of them. Um, through the collection, if we were to go beyond to say the quilts of Social Justice Sewing Academy, where young people, middle schoolers, high schoolers are spending a Saturday making a quilt, um, reflecting on their lives. Um, and presenting and in, in this form that is so near and dear <clears throat> the the story of their life like a moment um there's a whole series just on incarceration because the 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 group is interacting with enough kids whose parents are incarcerated and those themes start coming through in these small quilts that they make in one day and collecting them together into a single quilt conveys a story of where we are in our society today on, you know, incarceration. That's some heavy stuff. Yeah. Um, so is there um, in, in talking about a lot of the, the different elements that go into quilting, you know, we had talked about, um, 
the history of labor, we've talked about women's labor, um, we talk about even emotional labor and, and processing um, emotional burdens and trauma and social justice. So um, in terms of any of those kinds of difficulties, would you say that there is um, one particular project or one particular quilt that has been the most difficult for you in, in any of those terms? Um, and what kinds of challenges did you face while you were working on that quilt? Yeah, um, so there's a couple now, now that we've been through COVID, um, well, yeah, there's, there's more, there are more stories like that to be told. Um, so yeah, okay, so I made a quilt um, in honor of Eric Garner, um, who was Staten Island 2014, killed in broad daylight in a chokehold on a street corner for the alleged crime of selling loose cigarettes uh, in violation of New York tax code. Um, New York tax code does not come with a death penalty if you violate it, but in this case it did um, without due process. Uh, so his dying words were, I can't breathe, mm -hmm. I can't breathe, I can't breathe nine times until you uh, see him expire in a viral video. Um, and I kind of counted it nine times in the version of the video I saw. Um, I'm told he said it more than nine times. Um, but there's no better encapsulation for how I feel about uh, what's going on and my inability to understand. Um, and so I knew that I needed to make a quilt. I had never had the intention that it would be seen by anyone. I, it was for me um, a journey. So uh, there are, right? I don't know if you ever had to write lines when you were in elementary school as a punishment. Um, <clears throat> I will not talk in class, right? Uh, I will not talk in class and you had to write it 50 times. And the fastest way to do it is to go I, 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 W, 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 I, I, <laughs> and to write these lines and you're supposed to get a cramp in your hand and that's the punishment, right? And so to make the words, I can't breathe nine times, one could do kind of a, um, an assembly line process and just make nine I's and make nine C's. Um, but that was not my intention. I wasn't trying to do the most efficient piecing. I was trying to experience the, the uttering of the words and the, the labor of saying those words when you actually are experiencing those words, saying, I can't breathe as you expire. And so, you know, I'm normally listening to some really loud music because you can't hear music over the sound of a sewing machine very well. Um, but in this case, I just turned off all sounds, turn the lights down, just use a lamp over my sewing machine. And um, just one by one kind of made I can't make each letter separately, assemble it into the word, can't. Breathe and assemble it. And then I put together the phrase and then I put it on my table. But listening to each stitch, not trying to go really fast in my stitching on my machine and just feeling it and then putting it aside and starting again, I can't breathe. I can't breathe, step. And in one night, I made all nine phrases and then I bundled it all up and put it into a corner. It, it, it had, um, served its purpose. And I couldn't imagine, you know, touching it again. Um, but like six months later, seven months later, I revisited the stack. Uh, one might say I uh, excavated 
down on my sewing table to find that stack again and realize that perhaps I could try to do something with it. But then I just continue to make every stage um, such a process. So it's surrounded by a lot of dense patchwork made with small pieces, all in different blacks. I should say that all those black fabrics are Civil War prints. And so, you know, the meaning, the many layers of meaning is, is, are, are throughout this, um, if someone can point it out for you. And um, it, it was, yeah, it was rough to make that one. And then I entered it in QuiltCon 2015. And so, yeah, I think it exhibited in 20, yeah, 2015 in Pasadena, California. And um, the experience of being there in the exhibition with people who had never heard of Eric Conner, who had never heard of the incident, learning about it for the first time by experiencing my quilt. Um, there were a lot of tears in that space. There was a lot of um, not so good stuff too, um, but it, uh, it was on the front page of the LA Times, mm, my quilt was. <laughs> and um, yeah, that actually kind of is what launched the rest of what I do. Whew. Uh, we had just talked about um, quilting as storytelling, and if that is not one of the most powerful stories that I've heard in a long time, uh, I don't think I'm uh, alone in saying that a, a lot of us who are tuning into this program are going to be like carrying that weight um, and thinking about that tonight. And um, I want to thank you in particular too for for sharing that with us. Um, lastly, I, I wondered if you could tell us um, some projects that you're currently working on. I'm sorry, I'm not getting emotional here at all. It's fine. Um, any, any projects that you are currently working on and what you have planned for the future? Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So I am finally making a quilt for myself just out of scraps and it is the most fun it's what i need right now i did uh, accidentally take on an even bed, bigger and harder day job and so uh, you know i don't want to spend my weekends thinking about police killings and so instead i've kind of moved to ex examine a few other themes in life um some coming from uh african-american literary traditions um also exploring Okay, so I'm about to violate uh, it, but I'm also looking into um, pleas for um, lynching to be considered a federal crime. <laughs> it still is not. <laughs> and uh, there are there's a huge trove uh, in the National Archives um, of letters to presidents over many decades. And um, it is just fascinating to read the pain and to know, you know, I'm not going to say it's indifference, right? I, I have to believe that some of these presidents and their um, their their teams were were humans, uh, but we're still not that we're not, still not there yet. That we can't call this heinous crime a crime on the federal level is really kind of sad. So I think there's something to the words that are there and knowing uh, some of them, the people have been researched. And so we have a sense for who was writing this letter and at what time in their lives. And um, so I, I'm, I will be exploring that um, going forward. That's incredible, thank you. Um, we do have we do have time for some questions and answers and uh, Oh my goodness. Um, we actually, oh, we have um, someone who is asking if you have photos of the other quilts that you referenced, not just um, Cotton Sophisticate, if you are able to share other photos. Um, let's see. Um, I think we can go with this one. Oof. There's some four letters in here, but okay, we'll, we can, um, yeah, I'll just scroll past the, the 
the ones you might not want. Okay, so let me share screen and we'll do a PowerPoint. And I'll start with this one. And so this would be the, the one for T. So this is my Trayvon Martin quilt. Um, and these are all images of me in a hoodie in two-tone street art style. And sometimes you need to get back away from it to have them coalesce for you. But right, these are my nostrils. They're not really that big, but. Um, <laughs> and then this one is a profile in darkness, right? And so this is an eye, this is my nose and half of my lips and my chin. And then this one is kind of very contemplative and tipped over. And then Right, I got a ribbon. And I think I got like a couple hundred dollars, which paid for my plane ticket to Pasadena, right? You know, um, yeah. So this one is owned by Michigan State University. There's a lot of detail in this, if you could get up close and if your screen isn't too dark. Um, but yeah, so there's these blue bits as well throughout. Um, yeah. We have a question about, um, I noticed on your social media channels that you are knitting or crocheting. Is this a new project or a new direction for you? Um, no, it might be what we, we should call the origin, right? It's it's where I started. So my mom was um, a fierce crocheter. So she, she um, right, so I come from a dual career family, latchkey kid. Um, but on the weekends, my parents were very much present and both of them doing some sort of crafting or artistic work. And for my mother, her favorite was to come home on a Friday and then Friday night, she would just grab multiple balls of yarn and a crochet hook mm. and we would watch uh, Westerns <laughs> all weekend. And then by Monday morning, she would have crocheted in a bed size quilt uh, blanket. Sorry. And um, so, you know, as a little kid, I was we were all required to learn the skills that our parents were doing in some hopes that we would join in and you know my brother loved macrame and my sister is, is a very good uh, sketch artist. And um, I tried crochet for like five minutes I said this sucks and I threw it down and then um, I picked it up again uh, in you know, probably in my 20s at some point, just because I wanted a little Afghan for my couch uh, mm. for for TV watching, right? And it has, it, you know, blossomed into um, more of an artistic practice. At the same time, I was learning knitting, um, mainly because I wanted to make socks, um, but I knit blankets as well. And I also knit garments for very small beings, uh, so. I would say that I am working on an installation project um, with these blankets and with um, some crochet that my mother left behind. So. Here's an interesting question. Um, is any scrap too small to use? Um, unfortunately, I have to say no, because uh, I was recently offered time using an electron microscope. And so, uh, well, I'm totally kidding friends I'm not gonna like play with million dollar piece of equipment, but I would <laughs> if someone triple dog dared me I would. Um, yes right so unfortunately. Uh, so structurally if you're going to make a traditional patchwork quilt, then you do need enough of uh, enough threads of the weave to be able to have a seam to 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 attach things together using sewing 
But of course, you can create new fabrics in a lot of different ways using glue, using um, uh, other sorts of uh, adhesives that can allow, you can fuse fabrics together. So honestly, there is no scrap too small. And uh, a question just came in relatedly, um, is the lettering on your quilt applique, um, whether that is cotton sophisticated or, or any other quilt? Um, the ones I've shown you tonight are all pieced in using that improvisational style. And, um, but I, I am, I, I'm not picky, right? I start with what is the expression I want to make and then decide what's the best way to present that. So um, I've done it all, applique, embroidery, piecing, yeah. Do you, do you know going into a new project if this is going to be a quilt that is for you or if it is for um, public display or exhibit? Or does, does that sort of proceed organically? I prefer that it proceeds organically, but I'm getting more commissions and so then the pressure is there and so that's harder for me. I would I would rather have the kind of leisure to make the quote I'm going to make and then we decide. <laughs> <laughs> so. um, is there anything in particular that you've wanted to work on that you just haven't had um, the time to work on like is there anything if you could make a quilt i should say about one particular thing um anything what would you choose to make it on um so yeah i keep a notebook um where every day there's some quirky thing that happens or some heinous things that happens you know and whether it's in my personal life or in the world and i'll write it down and so i once you start having a whole notebook's worth of those, oh. it's daunting. And it's so what it is, is that whenever I'm ready to make a quilt, I just have, I have a place to go for inspiration. Mm -hmm. And um, it's wonderful walking down memory lane of weird things happening, but also, you know, then I usually kind of pick one and then I play around with the words for a while. I, I try my best not to make knee jerk kind of quilts where possibly I get the story wrong or I get something the the presentation or the expression wrong. So I'll spend a lot of time savoring the words um, alone and and playing around with um, I, I no longer use a thesaurus, but um, I used to kind of take a moment and just kind of chew on different variations of words and that that became that becomes more like a high school writerly way of doing things <laughs> um, instead of really kind of going from the gut of what you're trying to say and what you're trying to convey um, all that is to say i have plenty of ideas i just need time and so it's the it's the whole day job getting in the way kind of thing um, but unfortunately i also like my day job so <laughs> There are worse problems to have. You know. um, we are running a little bit short on time. Um, so if anyone has any more questions for Sean, please include them in the chat feature. Um, in, the, in wrapping up, um, I owe you a very, very deep thank you for sharing your story and your journey with us. Um, I encourage everyone who is participating and tuning into this program um, to visit siglmuseum.org. So you can see all of our upcoming programs and events. On Saturday, if you are in the Lehigh Valley, um, we are hosting Dr. Karen Britt and the American Association of University Women. Um, Dr. Britt is the founder of Juneteenth Lehigh Valley and she will be discussing um, her experiences growing up Black in Easton in the 1970s. And on March 3rd, um, we are very excited to be in conversation with Dr. Omara Zamora, who is a transnational Black Dominican Studies scholar and a spoken word poet, who will be um, speaking about Afro-Latinidad in the context of race, gender, and sexuality. Uh, I also encourage, um, I encourage you all again to join our organization um, as a member and enjoy free access to our museums and historic sites. Um, you can get into a lot of our programs for free and you additionally get access to our research library. 
So if we don't have any other questions, um, if you are in the Pennsylvania region, I hope that you have a very safe night tonight with the weather. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all again at our future programs. Thanks to all my former students and my colleagues. I love you all, I miss you. Thank <laughs> you.